We know that Palpatine won an election in Episode 1, but who had the dubious honor of running against the galaxy's future brutal dictator for the Chancellorship in the election of 32 BBY? Understandably, while the election of Palpatine was an important event during the film's time frame, spending more time on the election itself would not have been particularly helpful for the main plot points. So as a result, we don't know much from the movie about who he ran against, aside from their names and home planets. Bail Antilles of Alderaan, and Ainley Team of Malastare. So what platforms were they running on, and what did Palpatine run on, and how did the election actually go? Luckily, thanks to the books of the Expanded Universe, particularly Cloak of Deception and Darth Plagueis, we get a pretty complete picture of the election. One of the first things we know is that the incumbent Chancellor, Valorum, was not eligible to run for re-election after having lost the vote of no confidence called by Queen Amidala. Despite his inefficacy and allegations of corruption surrounding Valorum, the Jedi Council had made the decision to continue backing the Chancellor, seeing particularly the two frontrunners, who we'll get to in a moment, as both being the wrong choice. This was one of the many political missteps of the Jedi in this period, especially considering Valorum's ultimate fate, though not one of our main focuses for today. As the movie says, in the immediate aftermath of the No Confidence motion, there were two primary candidates running. Bail Antilles of Alderaan, representing the interests of the core, and Ainley Team of Malastare, popular in the Mid and Outer Rim. In the period before the Trade Federation crisis, Antilles was seen as Valorum's natural successor, and was often responsible for organizing votes behind Valorum's initiatives. Valorum's homeworld, Ariadu, was technically in the Outer Rim, but it was quite rich and human-dominated, so in most ways it was politically aligned with the core worlds. With the way that Valorum's reputation had begun to go, though, such a close association could lead to problems for Antilles. The growing power of the Trade Federation and other conglomerates had become a hugely divisive issue even without the blockade of Naboo. The question of whether further taxes should be levied on trade routes was a hot-button issue of the day. Ainley Team was opposed to the motion, saying there was no justification for taxing the trade routes as the Trade Federation, Corporate Alliance, and other similar companies were further militarizing themselves in order to defend them rather than relying on Republic protection. So, attempts to tax them would simply be, quote, skimming profits from those who endangered themselves to blaze the hyperspace routes now used by one and all. The point of contention there, though, was that many were made uneasy by the fact that the conglomerates were so heavily armed in the first place and had such influence in the Outer Rim. His outright support for the Trade Federation on almost every issue would have pushed more support to Bail Antilles, but many in the Outer Rim also felt that Antilles would not really act in the Outer Rim at all. He would simply put the Republic's focus coreward. There were other organizations within the Outer Rim, like the terrorist group known as the Nebula Front, which opposed the Trade Federation and had quite a lot of support. These problems would remain sticking points for both Team and Antilles. They would be core parts of both's platforms. But when while his association with Valorum was initially a problem, Antilles broke with Valorum and was partially responsible for bringing forward charges of financial impropriety to the Supreme Court regarding Valorum Shipping, a company from Valorum's home planet of Eriadu, and of which Valorum was a member of the board of directors. Now free of at least some of these perceived linkages with Valorum, whose reputation had been tarnished for a variety of real and manufactured reasons, including allegations of an affair with his aide Sateria, Antilles started to take a position as the strong central force in the election, standing against the threat of the Trade Federation and similar parties, a fact which encouraged the core and scared many in the Rim. Even those who typically opposed the Trade Federation because they believed more power for the core would be a problem for them. Ancient divisions between human and non-human members of the Republic were also played upon by both sides in this, with non-human worlds being more likely to support Anli Team, even if it meant more power went to the conglomerates because it would avoid giving more power to the humanocentric core led by Valorum and Antilles. All of these factors, manipulated in many ways by Darth Sidious and Darth Plagueis behind the scenes, conspired to make a third candidate appear as the best consensus option in a heavily divided Senate, Senator Palpatine. On the one hand, he was human and from a world which was currently going through a crisis caused by what the core feared, the rising power of the Trade Federation. On the other hand, for those senators in the Outer Rim, typically supporting Ainley Team but led by Ornfree Ta of Ryloth, Palpatine represented a human who, being from the Outer Rim, could 
sympathize with their opposition to the core and who they believed would be a different from the other humans leading the charge there. Orn Frita broke the unity of the Rim faction and was greatly important to the election of Palpatine. His position at the helm of the Outer Rim faction in the Senate gave him massive personal influence, and his nomination of the newest Vice Chancellor, the Chagrian Massimita, who would go on to be a valuable ally to Palpatine, gave him even further sway. But was less common knowledge was that the nomination of Emeta had been at Palpatine's suggestion. Ta was also responsible for nominating Palpatine himself as a candidate for the Chancellorship, which was not in fact a surprise to him, regardless of what he may claim, welcome, or otherwise. Combined with almost universal sympathy from either side towards Naboo's position, Palpatine was able to symbolize a broader consensus appeal, something he was able to solidify even more with other appearances during the election with other particularly non-human representatives from the Outer Rim. This would even include representatives from other future separatist corporations like the banking clan Sego to Mask, known to a more select group as Darth Plagueis, showing that despite the situation with the Trade Federation, Palpatine would not necessarily take a hard line against the corporations in all things, or abandon the Rim for the core. While we don't know the exact results of the Senate vote, as the Chancellor is elected by a vote within the Senate itself, rather than a full public galactic vote, we do know, thanks to the Darth Plagueis novel, that it was a close race helped along by the surprising absence of many of Palpatine's opponents during the voting. The political triumph of Palpatine's ascension to the Chancellorship and the breaking of Naboo's blockade were both big enough stories to bury other important bits of news, including the unexpected and tragic death of one of Palpatine's allies during the race, he go to mask. That's going to do it for today's video. I have a much longer one planned covering the way elections in the Senate work as a whole in the galaxy, kicking off what's hopefully a series of videos touching more directly on some historical and political science themes for here and for another secret project in the works. But as I was working on that script, I figured this might be an interesting shorter topic to cover first, so hopefully that next one will come out soon within the next couple weeks. Either way, if you're interested in that kind of thing, make sure to subscribe for more. Also, please leave a like if you've enjoyed the video, it really does help. Thank you for watching, and I hope to see you next time.